Hello and welcome to Health Affairs This Week, the podcast where health affairs editors go beyond the headlines to talk about the health policy news of the week. I'm Ellen Bayer. And I'm Christopher Fleming. We're recording this episode on July 6th, 2023, and just last week was the end of the term for the Supreme Court. And it's notable that several of the big decisions will have major implications for health care. This coming Monday, July 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, our editor-in-chief, Alan Weil, will be hosting a virtual Lunch and Learn event for Health Affairs Insiders, and he'll be joined by a panel of experts to provide a full Supreme Court wrap-up focused on the major health-related decisions and their implications. And we'll put a link in the show notes where you can register for that. Today, we're going to talk about one of the rulings that came out last week that might not at first glance seem like a healthcare decision, but that certainly will have a major impact on health, and that is the affirmative action case. Chris, I know you're an avid Supreme Court watcher. What can you tell us about the case? Yes, uh, Ellen. Well, this was a case where the plaintiffs challenged the admissions programs of Harvard and the University of North Carolina. Uh, Under previous case law, the Supreme Court had said that universities and other higher education institutions violated the Constitution if they used strict racial quotas uh, in their admissions process, but that race could be considered as one factor among many, a plus factor uh, in the case of affirmative action uh, to maintain a diverse student body. Uh, In their decision last week, however, the court said that the use of race at all uh, violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, and that applied directly uh, to the University of North Carolina because that's a, a public institution, a governmental institution. Uh, it also applied to Harvard uh, because uh, it, Harvard is governed like all uh, institutions that take federal funds uh, by the Civil Rights, uh, by excuse me, by Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, And that's been interpreted by the courts to be coextensive with the Equal Protection Clause. So before we go into the health implications of this case more deeply, I wanted to point out an excellent forefront article on the decision by Lindsay Wiley and co-authors that was just published on our website. Uh, We'll put a link in the show notes and we'll talk a little bit about it today, but uh, we we really can't do justice uh, to it. It's very comprehensive and and very nuanced, and I would really encourage readers to, to read the full piece. So let's talk about you know, how this decision, this affirmative action decision, will affect medical schools and other health professional schools. Um, the American Association of Medical Colleges submitted a friend of the court brief, or an amicus brief as they're called, on behalf of itself and uh, multiple other healthcare organizations. They urged the court not to ban consideration of race and admissions because uh, they argued that would hinder efforts to develop a diverse healthcare workforce. And we know that we're a long way from having a diverse physician workforce. Data from the American Academy of Family Physicians shows that Black and Hispanic populations are extremely underrepresented in the physician workforce. And diversity is critical to population health. The amicus brief you just mentioned, Chris, pointed out that diversity, quote unquote, literally saves lives. Yeah, that's right. Um, You know, the brief noted that there are these uh, continuing disparities uh, in health and health care that uh, disadvantage blacks and, and a lot of other people in the U.S. as well. Uh, just to cite some examples, black and Hispanic children with heart conditions are more likely to die than their white counterparts. Uh, black men are twice as likely to die of prostate cancer than white men. Uh, and a black mother is up to four times more likely than a white one to die in child, of childbirth-related complications. And significant disparities still exist even when you control for factors like socioeconomic status, lifestyle, and insurance coverage. You know, and, and as you pointed out, a diverse healthcare workforce matters when it comes to addressing disparities and making sure that all Americans can get quality care. Black physicians, for instance, are more likely than others to accurately assess uh, black patients' pain tolerance and to prescribe the correct amount of pain medication as a result. Uh, and for high-risk black newborns, uh, and this, you know, language really struck me. Uh, the AAMC brief uh, likened having a black physician to quote a miracle drug, uh, more than doubling the likelihood that the baby will live. Now, of course, you know, not all uh, minority patients are going to be treated by m- minority healthcare professionals. But the uh, amicus brief uh, filed by the AAMC also noted uh, research indicating, uh, and its physicians' experience uh, indicating as well that. 
disparities can be minimized when uh, health professionals have learned and worked next to colleagues of different racial and ethnic backgrounds, uh, reflecting the increasing diversity of the patients they serve. Uh, thus, diversity in medical education uh, yields better health outcomes, not just because minority professionals are more often willing to serve uh, in, uh, and very effective at serving in minority communities, uh, but because all physicians become better practitioners uh, if, if they work together uh, with people, uh, other practitioners of all backgrounds, and if they learn together uh, with other practitioners of all backgrounds. So Chris, given this Supreme Court ruling, what can medical schools and other health profession schools do going forward? Well, you know, one possibility is to argue in future cases, based on the considerations we just talked about, that there are special circumstances in the health professions field uh, that justify race-conscious admissions. You know, that, uh, it's, it's interesting because, you know, Wiley and co-authors of their piece point out, uh, for instance, that uh, the court's opinion did carve out a special exemption for military academies uh, to consider race and admissions because there were special circumstances there. The uh, military uh, branches were worried about having an increasingly diverse military commanded by a homogenous uh, officer corps. They thought that would be a, a bad situation, and the court agreed. Uh, Justice Jackson, in her dissent, uh, also noted the importance of having a diverse health care workforce. And the court itself, in the majority, uh, in one of the previous seminal cases on race and admission, the Baki case, uh, which concerned medical schools, the court noted uh, the same thing, the importance of diversity in uh, health professional education. But, you know, when you go back to, to the opinion last week, Justice, uh, the majority opinion included no such recognition, uh, so it's unlikely uh, that the court would extend the military exemption to health care, uh, doing so as, as uh, Professor Wiley and her colleagues point out in the forefront piece I mentioned. You know, that might be seen as opening a door to consideration of race and admissions in lots of other fields uh, where diversity could be seen as important. Uh, you could think of law, uh, education, the importance of having diverse teachers to teach an increasingly diverse student body. And, you know, once the court opened that door, they could be worried uh, that it would be hard to close and that would undermine their decision from last week. So, uh, and again, as, as uh, Wiley and her colleagues suggest, a uh, more promising way for medical schools and health professional uh, schools to proceed uh, based on the decision from last week might be uh, to pick up on another part of the, of the decision. The court said uh, schools can't consider race as such, but they can consider uh, or they can allow students to talk about in the applications process uh, the impact of race on their life uh, and the experience they've had uh, based on uh, how others see them and the experiences of things like racism uh, and the uh, ability that uh, these experiences to further the, the mission of the institutions, the educational institutions involved. Now, you know, want to be careful. The court warned that schools can't use uh, this uh, as a ruse to consider race as such. It can't use it as a backdoor uh, to get around the, the court's opinion. Uh, but it does provide one way that schools might uh, seek to maintain diversity uh, following on the decision from last week. So, Chris, the potential implications of the court's decision go beyond admissions, right? Yeah. Um, you know, there, there was another amicus brief a group of Republican lawmakers filed uh, in the run-up to the decision uh, they argued that uh, some of the race-conscious rules that states used during the uh, COVID pandemic to distribute scarce resources were unconstitutional. And as you know, race is used in multiple ways in public health efforts. Uh, for instance, uh, as the Forefront piece mentions, uh, race is often used as part of uh, so-called disadvantage uh, indices that guide resource allocation and reimbursement methodologies in, in health care and in public health. You know, so depending on how broadly uh, the, the Supreme Court's decision is interpreted and how policymakers react, there could be major consequences in health care and public health that go beyond just the admissions process. Well, clearly there's a lot more to be said and done um, following this decision. Um, we'll have to leave it there for today, but the conversation will continue. We encourage our listeners to tune in to Health Affairs Lunch and Learn event on Monday, July 10th at 2 o'clock Eastern time to learn more. Yeah, and again, I encourage folks uh, to read the Forefront piece uh, by uh, uh, Lindsay Wiley and co-authors. Uh, and I also encourage you, if you like this episode, 
Uh, tell a friend, tell lots of friends, uh, tell your enemies even. Uh, and be sure to subscribe to Health Affairs this week, uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks, Chris. 